Hello. Welcome again to Innovation 360 Institute's webinar presentation in our Change Management series, Battling Resistance to Change in an Organization. This is the first of the series, uh, Change Management series uh, webinar presentations that we will be doing. Uh, and as such, it uh, should be the first one that uh, you witness before moving on to the others, other webinar presentations that we have in this, in this series. We'll be laying a foundation for uh, change management uh, within individuals, and we'll be addressing the, uh, the specific uh, path that um, every individual takes when faced with um, change or uncertainty, either in an organization or uh, in their day-to-day -day lives. So we'll break this down into actual four stages of the individual change process uh, and talk about each one of the stages and try to understand some of the typical behaviors that uh, occur uh, as people progress through each stage. It's a very helpful discussion uh, because it's uh, good for us as change agents to be able to diagnose uh, those individuals who are affected by change and where they are in their particular individual change process. Um, once we have that understanding, we can talk about some uh, typical observed resistance behaviors and uh, we can list uh, some of the resistances, uh, the types of resistance that we actually see um, uh, manifest itself uh, as uh, the change effort continues and how we can actually battle those types of resistance. There are some things that we can do to facilitate a person's progression through their individual change process. And we'd like to uh, uh, at least highlight a few of them uh, for this uh, small conversation here. Charles Darwin once mentioned uh, in, his, in, his, uh, uh, in his books uh, that it's not really the strongest species that survives, nor is it the most intelligent species that survives. But really, it's the species that's the one that is the most responsive to change. That species or that individual or that employee that is very quick to adapt to a new environment is going to be the one that is set up more for success than those who are not prepared for a change and not prepared to adapt to the new environment. So really, as our change... Uh, our role as change agents, again, is to understand that each employee, each individual is going to have some kind of a response to a new environment. Uh, we're all, we're all, uh, um, uh, we all look for patterns of behavior, we all look for routines, and we find comfort in routines. So whenever the routines are broken, uh, we fall victim to uh, our own individual change process. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But let's look uh, in, the, in the, a grander scheme at uh, how actual companies change. Uh, we all know that, uh, that over time uh, companies have to continuously update their products and services, uh, update their, uh, uh, their offerings, uh, and keep in line with, uh, with their customer experience such that they can continue to uh, reap the benefits of, of having market share and, uh, and building profit and, and so forth. In order to survive and grow, each organization has to adapt to different changes in, in technology, uh, different changes in process, uh, new ideas, new innovations, and whatnot. Um, this happens over time, but what I'd like to talk about really is what happens in between each of these S-curves. Uh, we're familiar with the S-curve. Over time, uh, we build momentum with a new change. Uh, that momentum, of course, is slow uh, to be accepted in terms of organizational effectiveness. We get to a tipping point uh, where we have a certain percentage of the organization that accepts the change or accepts the new model, uh, where we see a, a great uh, massive growth, exponential growth in organizational effectiveness. Our goal really is to change to the new model before we begin to lose traction in terms of organizational effectiveness, in terms of profitability, uh, revenue, and whatnot. Uh, but what happens in between is really what I, uh, I, want to, uh, I want to break down. That space or that gap where we actually lose organizational effectiveness um, over time uh, as we are jumping to the new, uh, the new paradigm. This transformation point, if you will, is really where all of the chaos occurs. Right, so before the actual transformation occurs, we have established systems. We have this culture that's been solidified. We have subject matter experts that know the work, uh, that understand the work process, that can troubleshoot online in real time uh, and be able to 
uh, be able to adapt to that particular culture very quickly. It's a high level of effectiveness because there are, there are so many people in the, in the workspace that understands the actual work method uh, and the value stream that's occurring. When the transformation occurs, though, we have disruption. Uh, disruption to leadership, disruption to the system. We have uh, new learning opportunities uh, that have become available. We have created a vision, if you will, of uh, what this new model will look like, but we really don't have any proof that it's actually going to work. So we have a little nervousness going on. People are uh, a little anxious. They, uh, they, they're waiting to see if the, if the new model or the new paradigm is going to fail before they invest their time, energy, and interest into that new paradigm. So the effectiveness is actually reduced. Time that was normally spent on the day-to-day -day work activities and making the work activities more efficient and uh, less costly are now being spent on non-value-added activities associated with the actual transformation itself. No work is getting done as we're worried about what's going to happen to the business and what's going to happen to our jobs and what's going to happen to our friends and, and whatnot. Once the transformation, occur, transformation occurs, we have new systems. We have a different culture. Uh, we have different rules and regulations that drive effectiveness and drive uh, the business model. Uh, and we hope that if the transformation were a success, even though we lost a little bit of organizational effectiveness before or during the transformation, uh, over time we're going to end up with greater, a greater level or higher degree of effectiveness than what we had before. And again, this is almost mandatory for organizations if organizations want to survive. There has to be a constant evolution of new ideas and new innovations within the product and service offerings in order for the companies to stay afloat. Because again, the competition is doing the same. They're looking for the edge. They're looking for the, the balance. What should we expect from change? When a change event occurs, no matter how positive, no matter how promising, no matter how proactive, no matter how delightful the change offering looks on paper, we will always and we should always expect a sense of loss from employees, uh, from, from uh, right-minded, rationally thinking, rational-minded individuals who have a stake in the way things are today. We should expect the sense of loss when the change event actually occurs. And no matter how competent and committed our stakeholders are, no matter how competent and committed our subject matter experts are, we should expect a sense of confusion during the transformation point. There's always going to be a little bit of rustling of the papers to try to figure out how this thing works. Uh, our goal, again, as change managers, as uh, change agents, as people who are trying to implement innovation into our organization, is to expect these things and look for ways to reduce the confusion and the loss. And again, no matter how loyal our employees are, we should expect a little bit of skepticism and we should expect an increase in what we call the WIFM factor or the ME focus. WIFM, of course, is the acronym W-I-I-F-M stands for, yes, you guessed it, what's in it for me. No matter how loyal our employees are, we should expect a little bit of a step back into this. Now, I mentioned before that there's four stages uh, that individuals go through in this, in this change process. And this is adapted from a model that uh, was created by a psychologist back in the 1960s to explain uh, what, uh, what grief, grieving and loss looks like uh, to individuals who lose a, a, a close member of the family and some of the stages of, uh, of that cycle that they go through. We've adapted it a little bit just to make it a little bit clearer for organizational purposes, but uh, here's what we have going on. So when a change occurs, or when a change is expected, we would expect to see, at first glance, uh, a stage of denial. Now, if we're looking at this from a productivity standpoint over time, when denial sets in, uh, we can expect a little bit of loss of productivity, although not that much loss, because again, in the individual's minds, state of denial, there's still a, a little bit of a disbelief, some skepticism that the change is really going to occur, or that the change is just uh, something that's on paper, it's really not going to happen, they're just talking about it. Once the change starts to set in and the individuals begin to recognize that this isn't a laughing matter anymore, 
uh, they fall into a clear set of resistance behaviors. Now you see that uh, the, uh, as denoted by the, the quadrant and by the line uh, that, uh, that follows along from left to right, the amount of productivity in this particular stage is pretty low. And that's, uh, that, that's pretty self-evident. Uh, the, the amount of time and effort spent on trying to battle the change rather than accommodate the change and look for ways to be successful in the new model, uh, more time is spent uh, actually resisting the change. Right? Over time, of course, this, this process here can, can last for a very long time or it can, be, or it can last uh, for a very short amount of time. Again, it's all going to depend on the magnitude of the change event itself. Uh, and really the amount of skin in the game that that individual has with regards to the change. An operator that has to deal with brand new machinery, uh, a, a physician that has to accommodate a brand new operating room uh, setup, uh, these people are very deep into the process itself and they're going to have a little bit more sense of resistance than say a manager who only uh, arbitrarily or, or indirectly has some influence or some uh, uh, some connection to those processes. If the uh, change is successful in battling through resistance and getting more and more people to buy into the change, individuals will slide into the third quadrant which is a state of exploration. Again, it's still skepticism. We still have some sense of, of productivity but there will be a point in time where a, where a turn is made and we begin to see increasing levels of productivity. That turn from low levels of productivity to higher levels of productivity is really the point when the individual comes to terms with the old change no longer in existence, I'm sorry, the old paradigm no longer in existence, and the change events now being the way in which work gets done and is beginning to explore ways in which he or she can be successful in the new environment. That ushers them quickly into the fourth quadrant where, it, where we want all our employees to be, all our stakeholders to be, and that is the stage of commitment, where we expect people to have ownership of the new process, where accountability is now understood and new subject matter experts have been developed. And uh, we get to that point where we have higher, higher levels of productivity than where we were before uh, with, the, with the old paradigm. Now the ideal process, if we, were to, if we were to do something to this, because what we can't do is we can't just eliminate resistance and exploration. As change agents, we have to acknowledge the fact that every person is going to go through each of these four stages at their own pace and at their own degrees of severity. Some people, people who are very forward-leaning, people who are on the tip of the spear or people who have, have uh, initiated the change effort, uh, the new paradigm are going to be the, the ones that have the greatest degree of, of, uh, of speed through, the, through their own change process. Very little resistance, very little exploration, and they'll be the quickest, to the, th the first to get to the fourth quadrant of commitment. Our goal as change agents, again, is to try to reduce, not eliminate, but reduce the amount of time that is spent in resistance and exploration. And the best way to do this, of course, is not to surprise people with the change. We know that based on our own experience and how we react to change, when a change is sudden and unexpected, that our grief cycle, our path through these four stages is very severe and very long. Uh, the more unexpected the change and the greater that change impacts us, uh, the, 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 more, the longer it's going to take for us to get to commitment. But if we are prepared for change, if we know the change is coming, we can actually deal with our sense of denial, our sense of resistance, and our sense of exploration, almost preparing us for the moment when the change becomes real so that we are waiting for it in the commitment quadrant when that change event turns on and the new paradigm is reality. Let's go back to just the, the basic uh, individual change process here and let's talk about what we should expect to see now in each of the quadrants. Now, when you see somebody in denial, this is the kind of a behaviors that you would expect to see. You would expect to see this uh, indifference, um, behaviors such as disbelief, or even avoidance strategies, uh, avoidance strategies especially, uh, because the, uh, the paradigm itself has not been accepted. 
So nobody truly believes that there's going to be a, a, a new paradigm soon with new rules and new regulations and everybody must change to the new rules and regulations in order to survive. What we're going to hear from these people who are actually in the denial phase could be nothing. It could be absolute silence. It's the worst type of covert resistance when we aren't able to read uh, employees and understand where they are in the, in the uh, change cycle. Uh, we may hear comments like, oh, that, that won't happen here. Uh, that'll never happen. Uh, it's not going to, it's not going to be part of the paradigm. We're gonna, you know, the, uh, the, the comment uh, maybe 20 years ago that, uh, um, that there'd be a, 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 a computer in every household um, uh, that, uh, again, uh, Microsoft and, and, uh, and Apple uh, founders had actually made that comment and IBM again in their state of denial did not believe that the direction of computers would go in the in the consumer market uh, uh, market space uh, we could also hear it won't affect me and it, it has nothing to do with me so I don't have to worry about it I'm not going to think about it and again it goes goes back to the avoidance strategies that go on in denial in resistance what we're going to see is uh, a lot of anger uh, the emotions begin to come out um, we, we'll start to hear some complaining some uh, um, uh, some issues about uh, uh, looking for ways to shoot down the new idea or dismiss the new idea as truly the way in which the, the market is headed or the way in which the company is headed. Um, celebrating uh, past successes and uh, almost putting those past successes on a pedestal and saying we have, we're so good at what we do right now, why would we ever want to change? Um, a good example brought up uh, by Joel Barker in his uh, Paradigm series uh, videos, uh, where he states that the uh, uh, the uh, the best watchmakers in the world uh, prior to 1970 uh, were the uh, uh, the Swiss watchmaking uh, companies. Uh, they held uh, over 80 percent of the market share at that time, uh, and they did not believe that the direction of uh, the watchmaking and watch manufacturing industry was going to go in the way of the liquid quartz, uh, liquid uh, crystal display. Um, from that, of course, they, uh, they did not make the, uh, make the decision to invest their time and energy, and as a result, they lost uh, a significant amount of market share, as the story goes. So glorifying past, uh, past uh, successes really uh, tends to give us that sense of, of uh, uh, protection that we really don't have to buy into this new idea because we're so good at what we do today. Uh, we'll see skepticism and we'll also see an unwillingness, a blatant unwillingness to participate. Not take any training, uh, avoid training at the, at the, um, as best as they can, uh, things like that. So what we, we expected to hear from them, of course, is, uh, yeah, you know, that's not going to work here. Uh, you know, it used to be real cool. Uh, it used to be that uh, that we were the best watchmaking manufacturing uh, company in the in the world, uh, or that the data is flawed. Uh, once again, in, in shifting paradigms in, in industries and looking for innovations, the only evidence to support a shift in the paradigm is really based on an act of faith. It's based on an idea and an understanding that that there is a customer market, a potential market out there, uh, and from what you know from other webinars that we've done about the voice of the customer, we know that uh, delighter attributes are never spoken by our customers. Our customers cannot tell us exactly what they expect to see in the future for, their, for tomorrow's requirements. All they can tell you is they have gaps, they have holes, they have uh, opportunities, uh, they have problems, and uh, it's really up to us to look for, look for solutions. So using this excuse that the data is flawed is really just attempts to game the system to try to, again, continue to resist buying into the new idea. As people shift over to exploration, we'll start to see some energy uh, pick up. We'll start to see some risk taking. We'll see people taking that, that leap of faith into the new paradigm to explore the new idea, to understand how the idea would work, to begin to problem solve, to fill the gaps and the voids in their own knowledge uh, based on the knowledge that they must have in order to survive in the new environment. What we'll actually hear is uh, optimistic comments. You know, I've got, a, I've got an idea. I know how this might actually work. I know how I can adapt uh, this new paradigm into, into my work culture. 
uh, let's try this or let's, uh, let's do some what-if statements. Once we get into commitment, we'll see future orientation. We'll see uh, people taking initiative. Uh, we'll see self-efficiency. We'll see things like uh, Lean and Six Sigma beginning to take root onto the new process because people are energized into perfecting the new paradigm. And we see competence uh, because people's skill sets have been caught up. They've dealt with the past. They understood that uh, they were successful in the past. And now they must be successful in the future under the new set of rules. And they're confident that they can do so because they have the skills and the tools and the know-how necessary to make that happen. So we'll begin to hear things like, how can I contribute? And, uh, you know, let's get on with it. Let's start making improvements. Let's start, uh, let's keep our market share and let's try to grab more market share as we continue to make this new paradigm better, faster, and cheaper. So those are the faces, or those are the, uh, the different stages of resistance, uh, or stages of the whole cycle. Um, and of course, the, the big sticking point there is quadrant two, and that's the resistance block. That's where we see a massive loss in productivity. That's where we see most of our change initiatives fail due to the forces of resistance that crop up in our organizations. Again, our goal as change agents is to look for ways to uh, minimize the amount of resistance. So let's understand resistance. We see faces of resistance uh, uh, in many different ways. We talked about a few of them. But we have angers, we have, we have attacks, we have endless questions, details, uh, people going through the motions, uh, making false agreements but not really committing to, uh, to making change, claiming they don't have enough time, completing an entire withdrawal, um, ignoring it, denying it, glorifying the past. We know that these are the faces of resistance. Uh, but we can deal with some of these, especially the overt ones. When we see them, uh, we can, we can uh, possibly pigeonhole the behavior into a type of resistance that allow us to understand what's driving the behavior. And again, the behavior is what we have to deal with. Uh, if we can deal with the behavior, if we can isolate the behavior, understand the driver behind the behavior, uh, we can look for ways and explore ways to, uh, uh, to battle that behavior so that we can reduce the effects of that behavior. Uh, before we actually get into the two different types of resistance, or the three different types of resistance I'll talk about, uh, let's just look at uh, the, the faces of resistance. We have passive and active resistance. Active resistance, of course, is out in the open. It's, uh, it's overt. We know it because we can see it and, it, and as a result, it's more constructive as a resistance because we can deal with it in the moment. It's easier to manage that way. The passive resistance, however, is difficult because it is so co covert. It's hidden from us. We don't see it as often. Um, it can go unnoticed if people are good at hiding their feelings and hiding their sense of resistance. So we have to look for other things that actually clue us into uh, resistant behaviors. Uh, it truly undermines any effort to transform an organization, especially if we have passive resistance because that passive resistance is still resistance which means we still have some force out there that's blocking our ability to, to evoke the change. Resistance, again, it's not bad. It, we, we shouldn't look at it as a bad thing. We just have to recognize that it is just a normal reaction. It's a normal reaction to any kind of disruption and any kind of real or perceived loss. We should expect to see uh, resistance. So how do we deal with that? Let's look at some of the sources of resistance here. I want to talk about one source here, and that's the uh, one angle of resistance, and that's uh, resistance that's created because of a perceived or real belief that aptitude is, uh, uh, is lost. Uh, aptitude resistance is really driven by a belief that there is uh, an inability to actually make the change or be part of the change. Um, consider this to be a, a fear, if you will, uh, of, uh, of not being able to be successful, as successful as they are in the current paradigm. Attitude resistance really is driven by a, a behavior that an individual just really doesn't want to make the change. Uh, and that attitude resistance, again, is driven by willingness, um, by effort. Uh, it, it could also be a, an effect of past failures in uh, their own individual change cycles uh, and a recognition that, they, uh, that they've been burned in the past and they don't want to be part of any future change effort. 
So as a result of that, their attitude is going to, uh, their behaviors uh, are going to be driven more or less by attitude rather than by aptitude. There's a third one that I just want to, I just want to briefly talk about, and that's really the threshold of change. Um, there are situations in organizations where change is so rampant throughout an organization that we reach a, a saturation point. We cannot take on, we can't take in any additional uh, change event. Uh, we just don't have the energy to, uh, to uh, accommodate an additional change because we're so focused on all the other changes that are going on. Now we have to be cautious here uh, because this type of resistance, while it may be realistic, may also be a front, uh, an attempt to try to resist through behavior, um, an attempt to not buy into the new change because all of these other things are going on. So we have to be careful and cautious when an individual says that they just have so much going on, so many changes taking place in the organization, they can't take in another one. It may really be an excuse, <coughs> excuse me, an excuse that they're using. So let's talk about how we can combat these uh, different forces. Attitude and aptitude uh, are really the ones I want to focus on here. With aptitude resistance, we have to understand that it's driven by fear. Uh, it's driven by a belief uh, usually from subject matter experts, from people who know the rules and regulations of the current system. They have become effortless in their ability to uh, accomplish work under the new rules. And now that the new rules are put in place, they are fearful that they don't have the skill sets anymore to, to be successful in the new, op, in the new environment. Uh, Joel Barker calls this the going back to zero rule. Whenever rules and regulations are changed, whenever paradigm shifts, everybody goes back to zero. Everybody starts from scratch because there are no rules and regulations and there is no expertise in the new system, in the new paradigm. Some people uh, fear that. They fear uh, being left behind, not having the aptitude or the skills necessary to be successful. So our responsibility, if we can identify the resistance as being an aptitude resistance, then our responsibility is really to try to close the gap before the actual change occurs. Take those subject matter experts, understand their fear, address their fear, and identify the gaps that they have. What kind of skills are they going to need to be successful in the new environment and give them the skills before the change takes place. Countless organizations over the last 20 to 30 years have been doing just that as they've been bringing computers into the workplace. People who have not been too computer literate uh, feared that nifty little box because they did not have the skills. They didn't understand how it works. They didn't have a, a, a return feature and it didn't have a piece of paper. So they didn't understand how how you could actually write a letter on a screen and be able to save it onto a disk. Uh, give them the skills so that they can be successful in a new environment before the change occurs and you'll reduce that aptitude resistance. Right? Attitude resistance is a little different. We have to dig a little deeper with the attitude resistance. Attitude resistance is typically driven by that individual's past experiences. Like I mentioned before, a person uh, that was part of a change event that a change event failed miserably, they ended up getting burned for it, uh, they lost a lot of credibility, they uh, were ridiculed because they were, they were so excited about the change, but the change didn't occur because other people who were resisting were successful in, in uh, blocking that new paradigm shift. Uh, so they're a little bit skeptical, skeptical about jumping onto this new uh, bandwagon. So our responsibility really is to listen intently for their grievances. We have to listen into the grievance itself understand what the pain is with regards to jumping to the new process. They won't tell you directly what it was. They will tell you indirectly what's wrong with the new change and we will have to dig a little deeper to find out what really is happening here. Once we get the, once we understand the, the gap, we'll, uh, we'll allow them the opportunity to, to uh, do a comparison and contrast of the current process and the new process. And uh, we'll try to pr provide evidence uh, to, that gives them an understanding of the differences and why the new way is the way to go. And finally, let's try to, rather than just uh, throw examples and throw evidence and throw proof at them, let's convert them into problem solvers. Let's give them skin, skin in the game. 
Now, again, they're going to be skeptical at first, but we have to understand that the, uh, typically an overt resistance attitude uh, is coming from a person who wants to be part of the plan, wants to be successful, uh, wants, to, wants to ensure the, the uh, continued growth and success of the organization. They just don't want to be first. They just don't want to get burnt. They want to have evidence to, to support that, that this is the, the way to go. So let's get them involved in helping pave that, pave that way. They don't have to buy into it just yet. But as they solve problems, as they come up with new schemes for making the paradigm successful, they will buy into the process. And they will, they will again, reduce that attitude resistance. They will get them quicker into a state of exploration, which will usher them into a state of commitment. All right, so it's a very quick discussion. I realize that. Uh, we talked about a lot, uh, a lot of uh, different concepts here. We mentioned uh, uh, the individual change process and how we can really break it down into four quadrants or four stages uh, that each individual goes through in the order in which they go through, of course, of uh, resistance uh, or denial, resistance, exploration, and commitment. Uh, we took a look at some typical behaviors that occur in each one of those stages and how we might, uh, might help us troubleshoot where people are on that, uh, on that roadmap. Uh, we also looked at uh, some observed resistance behaviors and aptitude resistance and attitude resistance and also some things that we can do to, to help people with attitude resistance through and help people with aptitude resistance through that resistance stage, get them closer and quicker into a state of exploration and state of commitment. Hope you enjoyed uh, today's uh, webinar. Uh, once again, I'd like to remind you we have uh, continuous uh, webinars broadcast uh, uh, throughout, uh, uh, throughout the website. So explore the website. And again, this is the first in a series of many change management series, uh, in our change management series, uh, that uh, will we'll set the stage for our discussions on, uh, on other concepts, such as the six uh, levers of change, which is our next, uh, our next webinar broadcast. Thank you so very much. Uh, enjoy your day.